Hello, welcome. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50. Thank you for joining us for the Thinkers50 2023 Ideas Premiere. This is a curation of great ideas and fresh thinking from people in the Thinkers50 community to whet your appetite for our awards gala extravaganza in London in November. Tickets are still available, but disappearing fast. As you can see the link in the chat uh, allows you to buy a ticket, select hybrid tickets to attend in person or virtual tickets for remote access. Today, we'll be enjoying the company and insights of Howard Yu, Mark Grieven, Marianne Lewis, and a host of others. So thank you for joining us and thank you to all for contributing. And thank you to our partners and supporters, the Brightline Initiative, Exec Online, Fujitsu, Deloitte, Coaching.com, 100 Coaches, Wiley, The L Group, MCT, and India's Institute for Competitiveness, as well as world-leading business schools, IMD, INSEAD, IE, Westrom, and Holt. In this session, we explore the potential behind the shift towards ecosystem thinking and the opportunities that open up for business and society. But before we do, let's take a wider view of the ever-changing kaleidoscope that is strategic thinking with the shortlist for the Thinkers 50 Distinguished Achievement Award for Strategy, sponsored by the Brightline Initiative. Here is a quick video explaining the work of Brightline in helping transform organizations. To run a global organization is to be pushed and pulled by forces outside of our control. As leaders, we have a choice. Do we let these forces push us to and fro, changing only to stay afloat? Or do we do the pushing, pushing ourselves and our organizations to become transformative? Transformative organizations that don't just react, they act, charting new courses, evolving capability, and redefining expectations. At Brightline, we understand that great leaders must be energized. It's not enough to have a vision or even a strategy. Great leaders must harness the force of their entire organization, a force that comes from empowering their people, recognizing their vision, encouraging teamwork, and giving them the resources they need to become a force for change, a force for growth. As a global initiative of the Project Management Institute, we bring together leading experts to help unlock the knowledge, networks, and strategies leaders need to truly transform their organizations. Harness the power within your organization. Kickstart your transformation. Visit brightline.org. Thank you very much to Brightline for their support for our strategy award. We've been partners with Brightline for uh, nearly 10 years. Uh, and the shortlist for the strategy award is fantastic this year. Really strong lineup, I think. Greg Bernarda, Olaf Groff, Marquez Pozito, and Terence C. Fasal Hock, Kyan Krippendorf, Howard Yu, Mohan Subramaniam, Tammy Madsen, plus a, fine, a final group from MIT. Stephanie Werner, Werner and her colleagues. And now to the next session. Taking on an ecosystem lens means adjusting our focus to a scale and a set of design principles better suited for our time, whether we are working on solutions or many systemic issues, unlocking radically new value in our field, or meeting the more fundamental aspirations of our st stakeholders. In this session, we also explore the capability upgrade required to thrive and deliver the goods, a shift from a disruption to an upruption mindset. And your guide to the world of upruption is Greg Bernarda. As we see, Greg has been shortlisted for our strategy award. Greg mentors people and organizations in working collaborati collaboratively to invent the future. He believes 21st century leaders lead ecosystems, not just organizations, and they create better outcomes for all involved. He is co-author of Value Proposition Design and an and alumni of the World Econ Economic Forum. Greg is joined by two great guests, Josie Gibson and Eva Lotter Schostedt. Josie is Director of Catalyst FX and joy joins us from Australia. Eva Lotter is the founder and a board director at Kuno and author of The Movement of Trust. Welcome, Greg, Josie and Eva Lotter. Uh, over to you for the start, Greg. 
Thank you, Stuart. Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to see people joining in the chat. Uh, what I'm going to uh, do to get us started is share just a few thoughts to frame the topic. And I'll do that through a few slides. I think you see them on the screen now. And so I, I want to start from this standpoint, from this kind of proposition, if you will, that the language of business is too small for the kind of times that we live in. And it's too small for a wide variety of reasons. I think that a lot of us have experienced that in one way or another. A lot of organizations tell us that, uh, you know, there's too much complexity to deal with. It's really hard to integrate all of that complexity on top of trying to figure out new value creation schemes uh, and so on and so forth. It's also too small if you look at the kind of problems, you know, societal, environmental problems and issues that we see uh, in the world. The business logic doesn't quite, uh, can't quite grasp uh, the enormity of, the, of those challenges, if that's something that uh, we are interested in doing something about. And a different angle that's less talked about, but which I find interesting, this is Jaron Lanier is a technology pioneer and critique, uh, famous in Silicon Valley. And, and um, he, uh, he says this, this is an anecdote that I got from a podcast from him. He says, the higher up an executive is at Google and Facebook, the more aggressive they are at limiting screen time for their kids. In other words, it feels like we have one logic, one set of values, you know, when we go to work, and then we have another logic and another set of values when we come back home. This feels very schizophrenic to me. And schizophrenia can be really good, you know, if we are to solve some of these issues that we see in the world, if we're really to, you know, create, when we talk about innovation, it's about creating the world that we want to live in. And so if we come at it with a schizophrenic mindset, um, that's not a that's not a great start. So what I see uh, and I hear, I keep hearing in conversations everywhere from an angle or another is that there is a thirst for a different approach, an approach that can take in more complexity and also more subtlety. And so I want to share uh, kind of these two angles that I see that are, let's say maybe starting emerging. Some of it is old as well, but it's resurfacing. Uh, that is kind of creating the foundation for a new language, maybe. The first one is a shift from organization to ecosystem. So ecosystem is a big buzzword nowadays. So uh, for me, the inspiration or the discovery of the term ecosystem uh, is when I uh, discovered this guy, this is 10, 12 years ago in China on a, on a trip to China. And I you know, didn't know Jack Ma before. But I discovered him then. I discovered Taobao and the Alibaba empire. And lots of things have happened to Alibaba. But the very uh, first kind of phase of Taobao and Alibaba was really interesting to me. And at the same time as I was in China, I was starting to play with this business model canvas. I think it's 50 is familiar with the work of uh, Alex Osterwalder and Yves Pigneur. And um, so I was trying to map the story of Taobao onto the business model canvas and the you know business model thinking. And I realized that you know out of the you know in the 10 years that I was looking at the, the evolution of Taobao, it was a fantastic story of business innovation. You know, it's really hard to reinvent yourself as an organization. And here was a a, uh, a Chinese organization that had done that several times in the course of eight, 10 years. But there was also something else going on. There were things that I couldn't quite fit into the box of the business model. Things like back in 2003 in China, building trust in the economy. There wasn't a lot of trust in the economy in China in 2003. Building an infrastructure of digital payment platform. This is the world of e-commerce. If you don't have uh, digital payments, you, know, it, you can't go very far. It wasn't existing. So they said, okay, let's build the infrastructure facilitating the emergence of an express logistics infrastructure or, or players, and so on and so forth. Building micro entrepreneur, a uh, university for micro entrepreneurs, integrating all sorts of actors. So it sounded to me that it wasn't quite a business. It was more like managing, running a country or building a country from scratch, right? So this 
to me, it was really inspiring because I thought, okay, there's another type of animal out there. It's not just business. Uh, it, it's something else. And the word ecosystem kind of came up at that point. And I realized that it wasn't just about Taobao in China in 2003, but, you know, lots of, I would say, some of the most inspiring, um, transformative business and socioeconomic initiatives of the last hundred years share those kinds of characteristics. They're not just about entrepreneurship, they're not just about business, but they're about building a whole new system. And that requires a different kind of logic. And here's the logic. If you are one of these players, you're Jack Mao, you're one of these people or groups of people at the origin of such an initiative, and you go to a typical business school exam, you know, these are the kind of questions that you are asked, right? So you come in with your idea and you ask, you know, is there a market? Is the infrastructure available? Do people want it, et cetera? And these guys would basically have to say no to every one of these questions. There is no market, technology is not there. We'll have to build the infrastructure. We'll have to inspire people to want what they don't know they want. Uh, maybe they can't pay for it, so we'll help them pay for it. We'll create our own momentum, right? So it's a completely different logic. In other words, they would fail the business school 101 exam <laughs> because they're playing a different kind of game. They're pay playing a game at a different level altogether. And here's the metaphor that I find resonates with me. You know, if a CEO looks after their own house, then an ecosystem leader has to think a bit more like a mayor and take care basically of the whole village. So yes, they can take care of their own house as well, right? Their own organization. But the job description of a mayor is to also build schools, build roads, sewage plants, harmony in the village, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, the thing doesn't work. It's a different logic. And so if I go back to um, the kind of modeling language that uh, is part of the business model generation strategizer language, uh, you know, we say that we, we understand now that value creation is not just about throwing a feature here and there, right? There is, first of all, a thing that we can call a value proposition around a product or a service, which is a collection of features wrapped together into a story of value creation. And we understand that that's more powerful than just a feature. And in the last 10, 15 years, I would say we then all of a sudden realize, well, maybe that's not enough. Value propositions, product services, we have to embed them in business models. Business models bring other elements together into a yet more superior formula of value creation. Right. So and now I think a lot of people know know that in organizations. And what I'm suggesting is that now there is the emergence. And for some organizations, it's been there for a long time. But a lot more people are starting to become aware of this idea that even their own business model is embedded in a more complex terrain, a terrain that you can influence and out of which a more uh, sophisticated yet story of value creation can be created. A story of value creation that's not just for the organization itself, but that delivers the goods at the level at which we're playing, at the level of the ecosystem, which means it's, the, it's a purpose that's beyond the organization. It's a collective pur purpose. It's a societal purpose. So that's the first thing, first element of, uh, you know, kind of a shift uh, that maybe we need to embrace to, you know, broaden our understanding of what business can do, how it can inscribe itself into a higher logic. And there is a second uh, principle. Uh, and that second principle that I think is also needed if we want to address some of the things I was talking about at the beginning. And I would call that to go from compulsion to inspiration. Now, in the quest for a, a new, broader language, I think it's interesting to invite different kind of voices, unusual voices that are maybe less, uh, you know, less present in the world of business. So this is David White. David White is a poet. He's a famous poet. He's actually a poet that's paid by a lot of organizations to talk to leaders in new ways. And David went to TED and did his invited um, delivered a speech. And when we, he got back from TED, he had this comment. He said, you know, it's fantastic. It was a, a conference about the future. But 
you know, future is an interesting thing. So he, he, here was his comment. So many visions of the future are our adolescent hopes for escape from the heartbreak of the present. What does that mean? To me, it's a metaphor for, uh, you know, an invitation for the world of business and this discipline of innovation that has grown so much in the last 20 years again. Uh, but, you know, 20 years is still, you know, borderline teenagehood. So I feel like we, there is an invitation now to go from teenagehood to adulthood. What happens if you are, uh, you know, you get into adulthood? Well, you start to look at things in a different way. To me, this means kind of looking under the carpet, you know, lifting the carpet and maybe asking deeper questions not getting so excited with gadgets and with, you know, things that, that, that we can, you know, do to kind of avoid things, etc. But it is about asking deeper questions. What do people really want and need? Are there unhealthy patterns that are there that are kind of part of the logic that, you know, we should look at and, and get unstuck? What's the highest potential of the situation we're, we're looking at? And if we do that, if we ask these deeper questions, I think that we have a chance to discover new meaning and new meaning is always the prerequisite for new value so if we want new value if that's what we're after uh, and you know this links to conversations around what kind of growth we want in the future what kind of development we want in the future well i think meaning finding meaning is important um, and we'll unlock new value if we do it well now how does that work if we apply it back to my inspiration, my original inspiration in China with Taobao, what I found really interesting was that I, I interviewed some of the executives that were with Jack Ma at the very beginning. And uh, they said that the number one KPI, operational KPI of the startup Taobao at the, at the beginning was how many jobs are we going to be able to create? It wasn't about sending packages, selling subscriptions, etc. It was how many jobs can we create? And the idea here is that Taobao was kind of got that sense. You could say, you know, the sense of meeting the historical momentum of what was going on in China at the time. You know, China was in the process of lifting 800 million uh, of people out of poverty, I think the number is now. And so uh, Taobao understood that, well, this is really what is going on, what has meaning here, meaning for the government, you could say, meaning for the overall momentum, but meaning for the people of rising out of poverty, uh, you know, uh, and developing entrepreneurship and creativity, etc. in the process. So millions of jobs created. They also changed the culture of commerce, not just of e-commerce, but of commerce in terms of how people started to speak, relate to one another, uh, integrated uh, villages, rural villages into the economy. And the whole point of this was it wasn't about building a company, but it was building a whole new foundation so that new value creation could start happening. So now this inspired me to, uh, you know, kind of look at this. I mean, this to me is a story of empowerment, right? D delivering that kind of value, lifting people up upwards in that way. It's a story of empowerment. And I found that it was, it, it, there's a contrast to the story of e-commerce in the in the West, the way it developed in the West. In the West, the context was different. You have a functioning economy, you have quite a highly performing economy, and then you add a digital layer on top of it. If you do that, you get a lot of efficiency. You get you know, faster speeds, you get cheaper prices, you get more convenience. Now in the West, we're also enamored with this idea of efficiency and of disruption. Now disruption is funny if you are the disruptor. It's not so funny if you are the disruptee. And it's also not very clear the disruption really creates value for the whole, for society as a whole, right? There's a lot of debates about that. So I like another word better. I like this word, abruption better. And to me, the idea, the, difference, the key difference is that disruption kind of shifts value around if you, in an ecosystem, shifts value around to another set of actors, makes things more efficient, whereas abruption lifts the whole field up up whatever it is that you're working on, if it's mobility, commerce, mental health, etc. So it's about getting to a higher version of what it is that you're working on while lifting um, people in the process and unlocking new value creation. 
Now I'll say one last thing before we kick off the conversation, which is that all of what I said here, I think will basically not happen if there is no shift in our own leadership capacity, right? What I basically described in these two principles is that there is a horizontal stretch, if you will, that we're making by taking more in, by broadening what we take in with the shift from CEO to mayor, from organization to ecosystem. And then there is also a vertical stretch, if you will, of, as I said, look under the carpet, go down, understand what's going on, and then lift whatever you're working on to its highest potential. Now, these shifts are not just shifts that need to happen in the world. They also shift that need to have a, um, a mirror uh, effect, if you will, or a mirror movement inside our own minds. And I'll bring in another unusual voice that's not uh, very often seen in business, but Carl Jung from uh, my hometown of Zurich here. This is what he said. He was looking at the world of, of therapy, but he said an analyst or a therapist can help his patient just as far as he himself has gone and not a step further. Now, I think our patient today is the world, uh, the world, uh, you know, and, and then if we want to heal, you could say the dysfunctions in the world or bring the world to its highest potential. Well, we have to understand that we have to make room for this breadth and this depth uh, and this subtlety and this complexity inside ourselves uh, as well. And this is my last slide. So this is a quote from Carl Jung, but it's also really interesting to see that this exact thing that Jung says is uh, very well researched in a lot of different um, bodies of knowledge. This is one article that's be been very popular. It's an old article, 2005, I believe seven transformations of leadership. And I'll just, uh, without going too much in detail, but here just, just to highlight the fact that there are studies that says that uh, um, based on adult development, that there are different kinds of leaders out there and that there is an invitation for leaders to upgrade their own leadership style uh, and going from you know the opportunist all the way up there that is basically you know, all in for themselves, all the way to the alchemist down there. And the alchemists, the idea of the alchemist is that an alchemist can take in a lot more of these complexity, the subtlety, integrate different action logics, different uh, uh, logics that need to be integrated and do the kind of work at a systemic level that uh, is needed to address some of the things that I, I said up front. So I'm going to leave this here, and uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, I mean, what you're what you're calling for really is a kind of a reinvention of our notion of uh, corporate responsibility and managerial responsibility. It, it, it seems to me. Yeah, and I would say these terms have been um, corrupted in a way because it's often an afterthought, right? It's like we have our business, and then let's try and see uh, it's kind of putting lipstick on the pig right uh, how how are we gonna uh, smoothen things make things a bit less bad than uh, than uh, you know they, they might be and and I think here what I'm calling for is also to integrate this responsibility inside the value creation logic so it's not either or it's not an afterthought but it's really part of the same thing yeah, they used to say in 1950s, what, what's good for General Motors is good for America. And there's a sense mm. with the, the Taobao story of creating 16 million jobs that what they, they saw what was what's good for Taobao it w was good for China. And there's a very, very strong mm. link. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hopefully for the world as well, you could say there's no limit to this, I would say, nowadays. Mm. Well, It'd be good to bring in uh, Josie and uh, Eva, Eva Lotta to to hear their thoughts on on what, on what you've been saying, Greg. Uh, Josie, I know your your work focuses on catalysts, and uh, Greg was talking about alchemists, and I, I suspect there's not a great, huge difference. Yeah, look, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. I think it's so important, and Greg has raised some really great issues, and I, I think 
you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the what and the how and not enough time looking at the who. <clears throat> and I'm, I've, my experience has been in both in the field on big transport infrastructure, construction projects and state renewal and a whole lot of projects, but also working with individual leaders on how they navigate this. So I, I have quite a weird um, uh, set of insights into this. And the who is always the first thing. You know, how do you how do you approach this? This idea of an ecosystem, which Greg has so elegantly sketched out, um, in collective cultures like China, Taobao, in Africa, and a lot of a lot of um, indigenous cultures, this is actually not a crazy notion. But in the West, we have um, really moved far away from that, and so you know, part of the challenge that we have is to reconnect into some of the collective leadership practices, which um, I know through my experience that when you bring them into the workplace, people actually do respond really well. And I'd be interested to hear from Evelotta because I think that way of mobilising people is very natural. Evelotta, I mean, you're the author of the, the Movement of Trust and Greg has already mentioned trust a, a, a number a number of times what, what what's your take so my take is after 35 years in business i worked globally around the world uh, the recent years as a ceo and then stepped into non-exec i framed that because that's my my life experience so to say and then i write this book the movement of trust and i think the correlation there is is i can deep dive into a few examples one example is for example as greg mentioned you go to business school uh, I, I would like to say the other example, when you kind of assessed from business school into to a job somewhere, you're very much assessed on your ability to, to have knowledge, to have deep knowledge and go to great, great schools, right? And then on top of that, you should have skills to be able to perform on those knowledge. That's kind of how we limit ourselves when we recruit. And, and I think the third part, which really relates back to the ecosystem behavior or the, the way of being, is really to be evaluated also to develop around your character, your sense of self, in a way of how do you perceive yourself, how other perceive you, wherever you are. So, for example, I, I got to shook up as myself when I went to Japan. I was living there for four years, starting up IKEA in Japan. And I thought I knew a lot of things coming there, realizing I didn't. So, so I think that this notion of, of highlighting in recruitment processes or seeing it as a very big component when people are actually transforming into ecosystems or being able to actually understand who am I and what, how do I perceive me around my characteristics and, and, and a willingness to develop that in the circle of thinking more about myself, more about others and myself at the same time. There's a kind of a paradox there because we're kind of we're calling on managers to think more broadly about societal challenges, but at the same time you're challenging them to to think about themselves. Yeah, but I think I, another example linked to that, I can say I'm 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 on a board in London, an investment company. I'm, I'm chair of the ESG committee, and now everyone kind of when you talk about ESG, you kind of have to go broader than than within your own business, which is very complex and very difficult. And if you talk to the investment community, for example, you can align it to minimizing risk. So you, you need to find the motivation of doing something, not just for the good of thing. You need to kind of connect the dots between the business or performance and, and delivery into actually yourself and wanting to do more than just that. And I think that's a good example of, of when you're able to do that. Minimizing risk for the investment community is never wrong. And when you do that, you can actually look into the environmental damages that can happen to, to property, to real estate in this case. And then it kind of, you build the bridges between the two but by digging a bit deeper. Can I, can I jump in there? Um, I I've worked at a business school and a university. I've worked out in the field. And I think we have to completely rethink how we how we identify support, you know, to Everlotta's point, Greg's point, how we actually support non-traditional, um, interesting value creators 
to progress in their own individual way. And Jacob asked the question about, you know, how do Catalysts think? I, I've been studying that for 10 years. I set up the Catalyst Network to support people who were creating value but in a very different way, in, with very different language, very well suited to the ecosystem concept. Um, there was no place for them. And within organisations, they were generally not picked up within the talent pool, um, but they were given very big complex roles from a very young age because they exhibited um, a native intelligence to actually navigate these complex systems. And, you know, to Greg's point about uh, ecosystem intelligence, these are the people that we should be trying to find. And for 10 years I've, I've been um, watching and supporting these individuals um, trying to add value in different um, scenarios, but I haven't seen the system shift yet. There's lip service to it, but it's a very different way of operating, you know, and and they find a, more of a home in collective cultures and collective decision-making, but I, I'm not sure we're there yet. You know, it's a big transition we have to make. It always strikes me that um, Asian cultures are much more attuned to the ecosystem thinking because with ecosystem thinking, yeah. there's a degree of complexity, but there's also a degree of ambiguity. There's many there's many more gray areas. And I think Asian cultures are, are more, more attuned to those. It, I know you've spent a lot of time in China, Greg. Is, is, is that true, do you think? Yeah, I think there's a lot. I think a lot of the pioneers let's say in this last decade around ecosystems are, are coming from China. And I, I agree with you. There is, um, you know, this is one, one thing that surprised me in China is, is you, you met someone, but you, you never really understood the scope of their activity because everybody was involved in like five different things. And it's, uh, it's five different things that seem unrelated, but that are actually are kind of connected because, you know, one is being the president of the tennis association, the other one's running that business, et cetera. But somehow it's about relationships and flow, et cetera. So, and it's, it feels very normal to, to them, I think, to the, these, these kind of people uh, that I met to, you know, uh, be uh, um, inhabiting these different identities and, and, uh, and playing the, the, whole, the game as a whole right? rather than just being very specific in one thing. And was that your experience in China, Evelotta? Yeah, I, I, I worked in China, but mostly I, I lived for Japan, years in Japan. Japan. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I worked in China as well. But uh, I think there is this two things, or more than two things. One thing is, of course, this this sense of belonging to the group. It's not about the individual. The cultural aspect is really about the group dynamic. Uh, it's not about what I think, who I am. It's more about the group. But then, of course... In Japan, particularly, if you combine that with really being uh, avoiding uncertainty, it can also give a very big pressure to, to wanting to do something, become innovative within the group as an individual. So, so it has its plus and minuses, I think, in that sense as well. Um, so, so if you have to wait for the whole group to be ready to move, um, sometimes, you know, that can hinder some innovation and, and progress from individuals as well. Um, if I could jump in and talk about um, Greg's idea of the mayor of a, a, a village, because my experience working on big mega projects, for example, where you've got, um, you know, very, very um, diverse stakeholders with very different agendas, which is much like what Greg is talking about, you know, a typical village town, um, how do you how do you govern that? How do you mobilize people? And I think the complexity when you start to talk about some of the really complex things that we're tackling in business as well as society, this is where um, typically things fall over. Um, just about every mega project falls over at some point. Um, the social uh, sustainable development goals are struggling because, You've you we're we're struggling with how to govern it. We're struggling with the kinds of people that need to take key roles. We're struggling with how you hold a vision. A lot a lot of this stuff, and you know I I think 
you know, it comes back to technology is not going to enable us to do that. It might enable us to communicate about how to do it. But as humans, how do we actually create new models? To Greg's point, you know, how do we create new models that are adaptive enough to operate at that scale? We, we see opportunities all over the place, but I, I think, you know, there are, there are um, some qualities in people like courage that we aren't seeing enough of. Can I say that? You, you, ju you just did, Josie. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, Oops. I think Can there's I quite, step up, step up, I say. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's quite a lot of work around the idea of courage. You know, uh, Jim Duterte at uh, Darden Business School in the States. Sorry, Eva, a lot of you were just about to say something. No, we talked about courage and, and mayors. So, so I'm very involved since a couple of years, even before the war with Ukraine, and 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 work quite a lot there. Um, and you can say today in the organization I'm involved with, uh, there is a forced courage because of the situation they're in, obviously. And uh, we have a, a collective um, collaboration with 863 mayors. As of today, there is 1,400 in Ukraine. We speak to them more or less every week uh, in different subjects. And through the force of these terrible, awful circumstances they are within, it kind of given them, uh, uh, obviously, a motivation to join forces even more. So going from a mayor, um, you know, thinking into more economic unions in the regions, that's something that is created as we speak. Because everyone has just realized if we don't work together, we, we are going to fail. We're not going to win this, right? Uh, of course, that's is, is extreme circumstances, but there is still something that triggers it that doesn't have to be entirely bad and because it has created a lot of collaboration patterns that was non-existing before the war. It's a really interesting point that you make, and Greg, you can jump in at any time, but, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of research around emergency management disasters when people just step forward in that situation and they're hiding in plain sight, but they're not typically, if they were to work in, say, a bank, they probably wouldn't be picked up in the high potential talent pool. But these amazing people are in communities, they're in organisations, they're all around us, and we don't recognise them. We don't celebrate what they bring. Uh, and that's a beautiful example. Greg? Oh, well, I have yeah. a question for Josie, actually. I have oh. a question back to you, Josie. <laughs> what, what, how do you recognize these people? Now you've, you've been recruiting them into your network. What is the first, one of the first thing that you notice in them that you feel like, ah. Oh, you I make me them. sound like a stalker, Greg. Um, it's an <laughs> energy. It's a restless energy. It's a forward momentum. It's a forward um, focus. It's an ex a generosity of spirit. There's a whole lot of, um, you know, I can see the young ones coming through. If they have good sponsorship, they just come in, they they perform amazingly, they move on. So there's a, a, a natural ability to manage their ego because you have to have an ego to actually think you can do this stuff. Um, but it's the curiosity, it's the, the forward momentum and it's positive, and it's about people. It's a generosity. It's an invitation. And I'm sure you've all worked with people like that. Yeah, not many. <laughs> the, um, it goes back to our, our first session yesterday was about collaboration, and I, I think that combination of energy, generosity, and, and curiosity is, is, is spot on for what makes people collaborative. The um, but you're talking, Greg. You were talking about a shift in leadership capacity. So you're talking. Uh, Josie was talking about doing this at scale, and that that's the challenge. I mean, for years people have been saying, "Oh, we don't have enough leaders," which is quite funny, really, because mm -hmm. um, think of all the leadership development programs, the rise of business schools over the last century, and everybody's turning around and saying, "Well, we haven't got enough leaders." So there's something fundamentally wrong. But you're talking about a shift in leadership capacity. How, how's that going to come about? Yeah, I think is in recognizing just some of the things that Josie is talking about. Uh, you know, how do you and and it's not like there aren't institutions out there that don't encourage and and support the development of these traits, right? 
courage and uh, systems thinking and, and other things, but it's uh, not the mainstream. And so I would love to see some of these things becoming a, a, a lot more mainstream because it is, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that we recognize after the fact that was really uh, instrumental in a project, especially a, a complex project success. But before we don't really, it's, it's like as if we don't really dare talk to talk about it because it feels fluffy because, you know, a lot of people are, 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 are kind of afraid of that association with fluffiness, et cetera. What this, to me, what this uh, article that I pointed at at the end of the presentation says is that it's nothing to do with fluffiness. It is about rising to a, a different logic. It's about being practical at another more complex level. And if we can get that, I think that, you know, who, who does not want to get that, right? Um, so maybe it's, it's also about re, reframing the way we talk about these things in a way that they become, um, they become things that people really want to have for themselves rather than being afraid of, you know, disappearing from relevance in, in, uh, in a particular business context. Can I just quickly jump in there because Carlos made a point about, you know, soft skills. Um, what you've talked about um, and courage does not preclude delivery. And in my experience, people who are able to mobilise other people are really good at getting stuff done. They're very, very high value creators in every organisation that I've worked in. And yet they just move away from the sort of typical status driven, you know, they're more interested in the work. So there's a sort of shift of organizational focus that needs to happen to enable people to just, we want people to turn up as themselves, right? But actually we don't, you know, and, you know, we need to look harder and be more aware that these people just, just look at their track record for a start. That's what I always do. What have you actually done? Who have you done it with? How have you done it? Uh, uh, Evelotta, what, what sh can you tell us more about the, the Kuno leadership community what, in, your, in your work there? What, what are you trying to achieve there? Well, I'm trying to see what we're doing right now to have these dialogues with, with people around the globe and, 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 and raise awareness and consciousness around uh, who we are and what we need. That's the overall um, so connecting and inspiring is two key words for me. And um, I think that, um, so it's not the business in itself. Uh, and the book you mentioned is not to sell or write the book. It's actually just to try to inspire people to tell their stories about their experience. Because I truly believe uh, about this connection we just create and, and, and create dialogue around things that that will change. Um, so and then of course with my with my other leg in in the business environment and the business world I I think it sometimes it is difficult to to uh, have that intention and then the systematic approach or the governance doesn't support it then then it's really hard to make it happen um, but again back to my example with with the ESG um, work. Um, if you find the right trigger, the right angle for, for what how it can make sense uh, in the systematic approach we do have today and not give up, you can actually forcefully push through quite a lot of things into to making it more collaborative, more, more, you know, working as a mayor or an economic union in the world. And do you think there is an appetite for this dialogue? I mean, how, how do these ideas I mean you work with big organizations throughout the world, Greg? Is, is, is there, uh, are people now more receptive? Yeah, I find that people are, I mean, I, I do find that there is a thirst for this kind of, these kind of ideas that we're talking about, this kind of capacity, because um, maybe it's related to, you know, there's been a huge wave of say, personal development awareness. And, and a lot of people are looking at these things in their own lives, in their private lives. And then they get to work and they realize, oh, my God, you know, where where am I going to put this new thing that I've learned about myself? How am I going to deploy it? How am I going to put it to use? And so th there, there is kind of a feeling of being in a straitjacket. So in that sense, I, I don't 
I, I think it's at different levels of the organization. I'm not saying it's leaders or, or others, but I do think that there's a thirst to be coherent between personal and, and say, professional lives. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the first points you made, Greg, about um, the executives from Google and Facebook being strict with their children. But that disconnect between work and home, I, I can see it exists, but in, in yet in other ways, work and home have, have never been closer because people are actually physically working at home and there's no escape from work when, when, when you're at home. Can I can I maybe add to that? Sorry. I yeah. just want to say one thing here is that, that it's when you, when you, let's say you've been fired, you've been dismissed after 10, 15 years working really hard at a place. We see how that is really difficult for most people because if you start to identify yourself in what you do is who you are, you're off. So I, I do think it's very important when we talk about working from home, being at home, uh, that you need to really understand who am I, you know, in the sense and that never ends. Of course, that's that's a philosophical question. But I mean, to continuously work with understanding your own uh, behavior and who you are in the context you're in. Um, and you can do that endless different ways and don't uh, think that what you are and what title you have is actually the one you are. And that shapes you. I think that's a fundamental, important thing for people to take in. And organizations aren't in the business of helping people find who they are, in historically at least. No. Well, no? you know, I uh, sort of that I I have this ambivalent, uh, well, complex view about this, but I think it's up to each of us to actually do the work around what matters to us. And, and help others around us to actually, you know, back to the the sort of thorny issues of, of values that Evaloda has raised, do, do the work about what, what really matters and be more discerning. And I, I come back to the point that I raised earlier around everything's a who question. It all starts with who. Who am I and who do I want to work with? It's that simple. And if I don't want to work with, if I don't want to work with that person if I don't want to work with that organization I don't and you know all the data coming through in places like Australia that that I've seen is the younger guys are saying I don't want to work with them I I, I want to work much more aligned with the values that I have and it looks like that and and I think we're at this really interesting sort of threshold of change where values actually mean something mm. and and notions of responsibility. I mean, what, what we're talking about really is individual and organizational responsibility and the, the, the parameters of it are fundamentally changing or need to change. Greg? Yeah, I, I also think that it's beyond the organization and beyond the individual in a way because there is a societal responsibility of accompanying people in these maybe critical moments of transitions in life right so if you've been going into a tunnel of a school that educates you in a, in a very specific way then naturally you're going to go into you know kind of continue that continue that basically to pursue that logic but if if you've had an experience that gives you a sense of the kind of things that we're talking about looking at yourself understanding yourself your creativity your service your contribution some of these aspects I think, you know, so I, I think there's, there's room here for at key moments in a person's journey uh, to come up with interventions that help unlock uh, that, uh, the kind of things that we're talking about so that people then go into organizations and, and, and you know, naturally influence uh, or come in with a different influence. So it's like a kind of Venn diagram with society, organization, an individual, and something like that and hopefully yeah. a, su a sweet spot called trust in the middle i think uh, yeah, beyond, the, like that. beyond the trust i also think you know it's, it's so basic in a way that we all want to be seen we all, all want to be recognized you know coming into this talk I, I like you to see me right i like you to hear me i can maybe not expect you to love me but i want to be loved in my life right so where do i get that recognition in those circles you just mentioned and how important is it and i think that is something you know, because we're trained so much in 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 thinking. You know, if you, on one side we think about this logic, our smartness, our brains, our functioning, where we're able to communicate this way verbally, 
and then we have our dreams and our hopes on the other side, then there is a gap in between. And how do we bridge this gap in all those three circles with the fundamental needs of wanting to be liked or loved or cared for? Carlos says, linking with trust, bridging from trust, bonding in trust. Yeah. Carlos, you're almost the new David White with that level of poetry, <laughs> I think. Thank, thank, thank you. So where, where's all this going? Jo Josie, in five, ten years, where, 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 where do you think we will be? Because we need to be somewhere different, don't we? Uh, look, we're we're experiencing the birth of a new renaissance. I'm, I'm a very glass half full person. But I and I see I see the mobilization of these uh, amazing individuals and groups around the world starting to connect, and it's not the idea uh, idea of scale that we we've been fed. It's just a, a natural connection. It's a very sort of dynamic connection of people that are actually creating something new that's very human and very organic. So. Yeah, I'm I'm there. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and Evelotta, I mean, where where do you think we're? Are you positive and optimistic about where we're, where we're heading? Yeah, especially when I meet younger people than me, I get very enthusiastic and positive. Uh, as Josie said, you know, they are looking for something different, and and in the sense of where, where's you know, if you if you put words to it, it's it's purpose and belonging to something more uh, than just, you know, growth and performance and profits and deliver to shareholders or stakeholders. Um, and, and I need, I, I think that's a great positive movement that we need to need to embrace as well. Um, yeah. And Greg, are you bogged down in the heartbreak of the present? <laughs> yeah. how, 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 do you, how do you see the future filled with love? It's a useful place to be for a while, but not not to stay there all <laughs> all, all the time. I yeah share the uh, the fact that the younger generation is different, feels different, speaks different, is identifies themselves as different. You know, to different circles. I would say wider circles, wider belonging, and I think that uh, that is super positive. Uh, there's going to be moments where that movement hits and, and it's happening obviously hits against the wall and you know until the wall, wall uh, breaks but overall I find that um, that it is happening and I also think that it's an invitation for the older generation not to say oh my god you know let the new generation come and we need to step aside now because we're wrong no it's about accompanying that movement as well Everyone has a role to play in this, uh, and and I think a role that's very satisfying to uh, to everyone, you know, in in their in the journey where they're or in the moment of the journey where they're at in their lives. We're we're out of time. Uh, many thanks to Josie in Australia, uh, Eva, Eva Lotter in Sweden, and Greg in Switzerland for a, a brilliant session and a really interesting dialogue. And as Everlotta says, dialogue and conversation is essential for all human progress. Uh, so thank you very much, Greg, uh, Josie and Ever Everlotta. We are back in an hour with Howard Yu and Mark Grieven from M IMD to, to, to discover if you and your organization are future fit linked to our uh, previous conversation over the last hour. In the meantime, you can carry on the discussion in our networking room. The link is in the chat. Many thanks for joining us. Look forward to talking again and carrying on the conversation. Thank you.